doing LSAT questions alone isn't enough, whether they're untimed or timed. The real value in studying is finding out what you get wrong and what gives you difficulty and focusing on those. A lot of times students will focus only on what they get wrong. They'll look at the answer key and then kind of look back at the question and say, oh yeah, I get, I get it now, and then move on. But they don't really get it because just looking at the answer key and confirming what LSAC said isn't enough. You have to be able to articulate it to yourself. And so that's why a study group can be really useful. A tutor can be really useful. But if you don't have access to either of those options, you could just write it out on your own, either write it in a notebook or write it in a document on your computer or post about it online on a forum. But articulating it and then getting feedback from others is really useful. And so if you're studying and you're in the only, let's say you're in the 130s or 140s, you find a friend who, or someone online who's in the 160s or above, that's enough of a, of a difference where the person in the 160s could help you out because they know a bit more than you do about the LSAT. But also even the person in the 160s teaching the person with the lower score can learn by teaching as well. You know, I, it took me a year to get to a 175, but it took me far longer than that before I was able to gain the level of understanding on this exam that I have now. And so it's a process and teaching shows you different ways to explain a problem so that someone else will get it. And it helps you kind of think out loud as well. And so both parties can benefit from that. And so not only do I want you to review your week, your, whatever you get wrong, I also want you to review anything that gives you difficulty. So let's say you're scoring in a low 160s, let's say, and you're getting maybe 20 questions wrong. There might be another five to 10 questions where you guessed and got it right, but it could have just as easily gone the other way the next time around. And so for that reason, you will actually want to study those additional five or 10 questions as well on top of the 20 or so you may have gotten wrong. You had them together. That, of course, is a lot of questions to review. And you might say, I don't have time for all that. And my answer for you would then be, do fewer exams, change the ratio of your study time so that it's not... 90% exams and 10% review. It should actually be closer to 50% doing exams and 50% doing review. And that might sound like a lot, and it is a lot. And it's, it's grueling, and it's not always fun. It's especially when you're finding the gaps in your understanding, because it's basically pointing out the exact reasons why you're not doing as well as you could be. But better that you do that now than that you do that closer to test day or on test day itself, right? You want to have that progression along the way. Because like I said, the LSAT is a lot about pattern recognition. So if you don't learn from your mistakes, you really will be doomed to make them again. And I'd rather you learn them now so that you don't make them again on any future timed practice tests or, of course, on the real thing now. But at least if you're finding out what you have trouble with now, you can improve now and not walk into test day still having some gaps in your understanding. And so let's say you're doing one exam or two exams and you find that you got a bunch of necessary assumption questions wrong or a bunch of flaw questions wrong, that could just be because those question types show up more often than others. It wouldn't necessarily mean that you have a disproportionate difficulty in understanding those particular question types. So you want to definitely consider the fre frequency with, with which certain question types appear. But it's also, I would say, not enough just to review logical reasoning or games by their question type. You also want to think about the reasoning going on in the stimulus, if it's logical reasoning, for example. So it may, may not be that it was a flaw question. It may instead be that it was testing a certain kind of reasoning like causality or correlation causation or confusing necessary and sufficient conditions or other classic types of logical fallacies. So think about whether when you're reviewing, is your misunderstanding stemming from the question type or from the method of reasoning in the stimulus? or from some pattern in the answer choices. And if it was in the answer choices, what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that, chose you to, that led you to pick it? And what ultimately made it wrong? And what's discouraging about the right answer choice that pushes you away from it? And what ultimately makes it correct? You wanna do that again and again and again so that you can see the particular gaps in your understanding, whether it's about certain types of traps of encouragement luring you towards wrong answer choices or traps of discouragement pushing you away from right answer choices. And of course, you're not falling for every single trap or every single trick because if you were, you'd be getting everything wrong and maybe getting a 120 or 125. So if presumably you're doing somewhat better than that, and if not, it's okay. But if you are, then 
you want to see which specific traps you're falling for in the answer choices or maybe unfamiliar wording for a particular question stem or maybe it's the stimulus or the argument itself. And that, so that process, it takes time. I definitely recommend keeping some type of running list or journal or document listing the exact prep test number, section number, and question number for everything you've ever gotten wrong or had difficulty with because you can gain a lot of value by returning to that again and again and again over time. And you might want to attempt those same questions multiple times, 5, 10, 15, 20 times. It's actually not too much, as crazy as that sounds. And you'll see that if you've got that question wrong once, you are, of course, more likely to get it wrong in the future than something random. But if you do it, let's say, three times or six times, you can see that you get it right all three to six times. Or maybe you got it right the first three times, got it wrong the fourth time, got it right the fifth, but then got it wrong again the sixth. And so that suggests that maybe you haven't learned everything you need to know about that particular question. And it's worth, of course, reviewing it again. 